this is Sarah Milligan, um, it's March 13th, 2017. Uh, this interview is a part of the CEC project um, for the OSU Library and the Oklahoma Oral History Research Project. Um, I'm here today in Tishomingo talking to Roger Baker at the Baker Acre Farm. <laughs> right? I do like that. I like that name. It's a ba Baker Pecans. Baker, Baker Pecans. But there is a Baker's Acres <laughs> pumpkin patch. <laughs> well, that's what your sign on the corner and your sign out front is Baker, Baker's Acres, which is the, yeah, that's part of it. Part of it. Anyway, we'll, and we'll elaborate that in a minute. Uh, okay, so where I want to start is just with some general background information. Tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, maybe a little bit about your family. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let's start there. Start there? Yeah. Well, I was raised on a farm in, in Tishomingo, rural community, and uh, lived there all my school years, graduated from Tishomingo High School. My father was in agriculture. He was uh, uh, a, uh, a government employee of the, used to be AAA, and it's changed to the FSA, mm -hmm. county. Uh, government office and uh, anyway I was I was raised here on the farm this very place right where we're here. at right now yeah huh. I lived here all my life I've never had a real job <laughs> but you work pretty hard for never to have a real job <laughs> so did you grow up I get there's a there's a house over yeah the little frame house is yeah. where I grew up yeah we just barely had a bathroom <laughs> Did you have any siblings? I had two sisters, one older that I didn't know and one younger that I didn't know. That I didn't know them, but they were, they were older. We were, my, my older sister was eight years older and my young sister was 10 years younger. Oh my goodness, that is an age gap. That is an age gap. Yeah. So your dad was in agriculture. Um, graduated from OSU. When did he graduate from OSU? He graduated in 1936. Um, so he worked in agriculture, did he also, because this is a big area of land, I don't know if it's, it, I don't know how many acres it is. Here? Mm -hmm. It's not a large part. He didn't, he, he was never in a lot of production. He did grow, uh, he did grow vegetables and, and watermelons and cantaloupe and he was, uh, they did a lot, his, his dad was big in sweet potatoes in Haskell County. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, we grew sweet, sweet potatoes. I used to help him plant sweet potatoes in the, in the spring. And uh, we did that and, and dug those and sold them all winter. Did you sell them from your house or did you take them out in the community and sell them? Now, he sold those, but we, we stored them in a storage barn and then he would get them and sell them to grocery stores and, and uh, and I don't know if he sold farmer's market. I don't know if they had farmer's market back then. But anyway, there was markets. There was uh, uh, markets in Ardmore and Ada where you could sell vegetables, produce, markets. Mm -hmm. That's the way it used to be, I think. They, the farmers used to grow them and take them in there, and then they'd sell them, and then the produce handlers would distribute and sell them. So that's what he did on sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. In fact, he had, a, he had an organization that uh, there was a group of people that grew sweet potatoes and he, he, he supplied the, the, the seed potatoes and the slips to these farmers and then they bought the slips and they planted them and then they produced them and dug them and sold them. Oh, okay. So there was a group. I see. And that was on top of his I yeah, guess, day full, job. Yeah, right? he was full-time uh, yeah. agriculture and we had a, a few cows. He was never big. Uh, volume wise and uh, then he retired he he retired when he was 56 which is pretty young I'm 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 fixing to be 69 and I hadn't retired yet <laughs> I don't know if I can or not but anyway uh, so he retired and I, I started with this and I used his the land here and got into cattle first of all 
and uh, uh, had, had quite a few mama cows, about 300 mama cows. And we did that for, I did that for about 20 years and finally sold those out. Went broke twice, it's the cattle business. But sold those out and then uh, uh, diversified into other things, but and always enjoyed the pecan business. We had a pecan trees and we harvested those. And, when your dad was here too, yeah, you know, would you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, he bought a pecan shaker, one of the first pecan shakers around, and of course we had to pick them up by hand, but, but since then, when I started back, as a, actually the pecan business, I started in the, in, ni in the early 90s, bought a harvester and started doing a little bit of custom work, and, and, uh, and then uh, I did some custom kind of cleaning for other harvesters, but I, I've developed uh, my trees that I harvest to where I've got about 10,000 trees that I harvest and it'll make anywhere from 200 to 400,000 pounds a year of pecans. And then I'll clean around a million pounds a year. For you clean up those for other people? Other people, then we well, then we, we market those pecans. Uh, that that is developed over over the what is that twenty five years, mm -hmm. and at the time I was doing that, I, I just had a thought that there were so many facets in in, in enterprises in in the pecan business that that I, I started looking at different enterprises, and so I started raising pecan trees to to, to plant, and it took me probably 15 years to perfect what I needed to do. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes and I planted trees, and, but now in the last seven years, I've grown to where I'm producing, growing about 100,000 trees a year, but I'm selling grafted trees to, to other pecan producers. And uh, that uh, we're selling, we're gonna sell about 12,000 this year, next year probably 15 or 20,000 trees. And they go in mostly Oklahoma, in the Tulsa area, northern Oklahoma, is the fastest growing. Although the Red River counties have a lot of potential, and there are people studying that, uh, but I also sell in Missouri and Kansas and Illinois. Why do you think that the Tulsa area has grown so fast? I don't know. I think it's, uh, I, there's a lot more, I think there was a lot more orchards planted years ago up there. And that's, and, and, and so they've increased because of that. Down here, there's not as many orchards, there's more native areas. But uh, uh, I think it's, the con deal is, it, it, the, the con association of Oklahoma is, is promoted the product through with OSU. OSU has been a big help in the pecan growers. I, I was a board member for a couple of terms and, and I've since resigned, but uh, my son has taken my place. He's on the pecan growers board uh -oh. and they meet several times a year and put on the, the fall show. And uh, we, uh, we had a field day last fall here at our nursery. We had probably 75 people come all over the state of Oklahoma, most, a lot of them from Tulsa, came to our, our farm and toured our, our nursery. And, and we had uh, uh, Charles Rolla, who's a graduate of OSU, that's a, he, he's at Noble Foundation, had, he's the director of the Con Research Noble Foundation. He was there along with Becky Carroll from OSU. And uh, they, uh, they helped put this field day on and we discussed planting and trees and varieties and, and how to do it and some demonstrations. And, and uh, but anyway, the, the pecan deal is, I think it's got a lot of potential. We've just passed the, the National uh, Pecan Council has just been organized to promote pecans and they're, they're the check off. It's not really a checkoff. It's a government program, and I, I, I just can't tell you what the name, what type it is. But it's 
It's a federal? It's a federal. And there's a two cent uh, charge for natives and three cents for improved that goes into the advertising and promotion budget and education and research. And uh, that's uh, that should uh, raise several million dollars to promote pecans. Other tree nuts are doing the same. I've already done it. Almonds have got that, and they're you know have a lot of advertisements on even the Super Bowl and pistachios. Well, pecans are the are one of the most healthy nuts there is, and it, it needs to be promoted as a health health food. And, and they are, all the nuts are, but there's a lot of potential for pecans. And it's, it's native to this area, to Oklahoma, mm -hmm. central United States. And uh, it, uh, it, it's got a lot of potential. And there's a lot of different areas of pecan business that a person needs to look at. But it, uh, I enjoy it, and it, it's, it's always, uh, Something, something in my blood about pecans that I just, I just love it. Love all the aspects. How do, you, so I, I understand that, um, you know, you, your dad did a little bit, so you had some engagement with, you know, harvesting and selling pecans, and then you kind of got into it. It sounds like sort of slowly, but and built up from there. Um, I, I'm interested in how involved you are, like, on the state level and on the promotional sort of level, too. Um, when did you start getting involved in some of the, not just your own doing, but all that other networking part of it? How do you... Well, uh, I, I think uh, it, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, I, the tree growing was very slow to materialize. I'm, I'm actually the only pecan nursery in Oklahoma. There, no one else is growing any grafted trees in Oklahoma. There are some people that, that have trees for sale that they bought from another state. But now Texas has got several nurseries mm -hmm. in Texas. There's some in California, some in Georgia. But now California and Georgia are, they're in a they're in a different uh, area of the nation that is this, there's not like Oklahoma, but North Texas and Oklahoma are pretty unique in in, in what they need, and uh, I'm trying to develop uh, trees that will that will could be established in all of Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and and and, and northern states like mm -hmm. Illinois. Uh, so that's what I'm focusing on. Is, is those that aspect of, of the pecan tree nursery, which I'm one of the few that just devotes all their trees to that area. Texas, I mean, they have to go clear to the Gulf Coast and, and east, uh, east Texas and west Texas, and so they're 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 down there more uh, to where the temperatures are a lot warmer, not as cold. Mm -hmm. So we have to have cold hardy varieties, and so that's what I. Uh, I'm focusing on. So the difference, I guess, I'm hearing between not just Texas, but also the California and the Georgia is that the variety that they have doesn't have to be as cold weather hardy. Is that That's what correct. you're... Correct. That's correct. Georgia, as far as I know, does not sell trees, raise trees that would work uh, north of Interstate 40 in Oklahoma. I mean, it'd be risky mm -hmm. to plant them. Maybe south of 40, you might, but you never know. It could get uh, uh, cold enough that you could have some freeze damage on some of those southern varieties. Mm -hmm. There's two ty there's two things to the country when you have a nursery. You got the rootstock, and it has to be cold hardy, and it's completely different from the top. It's the rootstock. It's got to be cold hardy, and then your graft. There's so many varieties that are good to the north, so many varieties that are good to the south, and I have both kinds. I don't sell my southern varieties up north. I just sell them to the southern areas, and so, but you, you have to, I'm the, trying to develop a, a couple more varieties for the north that I'm, I'm uh, getting some graft wood out of Kansas to uh, 
a newer variety. A couple of when I say newer, they're 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 uh, different than what I've been doing. And uh, uh, major is a is a one that's not well known, but it is a northern variety that's very excellent. Come and shepherd is another new one that I've just started this year grafting. So how did you? Well, okay, I have a couple of things I'm trying to think about out of that. How did you get involved in in the the sort of grafting um, more more ready access to some of those varieties? Because we were talking about this before this before we sat down, and the grafting is um, it's really interesting, right? Maybe you can describe what you mean by grafting, and then maybe talk to me about how you choose what you're gonna how you how you get those grafts and okay. things like that. Well the grafting is uh, grafting a pecan is is you you have a, a root stock that you're gonna use, a tree that you're gonna graft to, you have to have something growing. And then the graft is wood that you cut from a variety tree that you know that is a certain variety and and uh, you'll cut a uh, an adult limb that's growing on this tree and you'll have buds on it and every one of those buds is has, has got the same genetics as that tree does and when you put one of those buds on another tree and you force that bud to grow and not and limit that tree to just that one bud then you've got that variety it's a clone it's exactly what the parent was just a clone if you plant a nut it's not the same it's different all nuts are cross pecan trees mm -hmm. pecan trees are not self-pollinating there it takes two different trees to pollinate pecans because they there's they have their pollen and their flowers come off at separate times so you and 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 some of them are reversed and some of them uh, are, are shed pollen first and some have flowers so they mm -hmm. pollinate cross if they pollinate themselves Usually, those pecans will abort. They they're they're not fertile. They're not. They won't mature. They'll fall off the tree because the genetics aren't right. They're not. They're not an outcross. So all nuts are not. They're they came off one tree, but they're all different because they're all cross pollinated, and just like anything else, that cannot would not be. Similar. So the only way to make sure that you're actually growing the same variety of tree exactly the same is what you're, you know, sort of making sure that you're getting the hardy stock from the same tree, the same area of trees that have been growing in that weather is to do the grafting then. Yes, you have to, you have to have a graft. You have to graft the uh, variety of trees that you select and you have to go places to find that graft wood. Uh, originally starting the, the, the USDA uh, pecan research, there's three, three, three uh, uh, research stations in the United States that breed pecans and they specifically use varieties and cross them and then they develop new varieties from those control crosses mm -hmm. and that's how, you, when they develop one and then they study it for 20 years, a lot of these varieties are 50 years old, but they're, they're relatively new. It takes a long time before they release them. They, they get that variety they kind of think is right, and then the, but they'll grow it and they'll clone it, and they'll, they'll, for 20 years until they get crops, they're 20 years old and they're producing before they release a new variety. So they've got a lot of study. Wow. Now that, that is probably, not going to continue like it has in the past. I think federal cutbacks are going to hurt that program. So I don't know what's going to happen. But uh, the new varieties may not be here because it takes so long to do that. Uh, all these varieties that are bred by the U.S. Department of Agriculture have no have no uh, patent. But now there are one or two varieties that somebody else has developed that has a patent and you have to pay a fee. Every tree is a fee. You have to pay a dollar or whatever the fee is 
every time you graft one to that tree, so to the whoever originated that, and so it's controlled. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that. Uh, so is that how you get your your grafting material then from the USDA well, or from other? I areas? mean, originally when they just released one for the first two or three years, there's there's no available graft wood because the trees that were aren't big enough. So you go to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they'll supply nurseries with small amount of graft wood. Okay, I'll get that small amount. I may have may have 20 trees grafted to this one variety, new variety. I'll get those, and then I'll graft them. Then I'll plant them, and I'll grow them. And it, it could be five or six, seven, eight years before I could get graft wood from those trees on the new varieties. The old varieties, there, there's orchards, and I go to, I, I, to certified orchards where they have the varieties in rows and they're named and they've got them cataloged so I can get a variety off a certain tree and it's, it's uh, relatively sure that that's correct on the variety. Mm -hmm. You can't just go anywhere and get those, that wood. You have to go somewhere where you're sure it's, it's uh, cataloged. So, but amount that I graft, uh, it, there's a stick of woods about 10 inches long and it's got six or seven buds on it. And for me to graft 20,000 trees, I'd need 30,000 buds and, that, and that's a, two miles of graft wood. And that's a lot of cutting, but. So how do you get it then? I cut it. Do you? Out of the top of a tree. So do you have relationships with people that let you come in and yes. get graft wood? The, the, the funny thing is everybody that's got nice orchards, that's, that's certified orchards, they'd love for you to promote the con business. They'd love for you to uh, uh, grow trees. They may need trees, more trees themselves. So uh, they don't actually charge anything for me to do it, although it, it it takes me several hours to get this today. When I graft trees in June, July, and August, I cut fresh graft wood, cut it the day before I use it, and I can use it for two or three days, and then I have to go get more. And whatever I don't use, throw it away. And and so it takes a lot of graft wood. Uh, but I cut graft wood probably takes four to six hours, two or three times a week, two or three people and uh, several ice chests full of, we gotta keep it cool and moist. And so it's got, everything's, it's alive. Everything's alive. Uh -huh. So you gotta be careful how you handle it. But it's, it's uh, on a small scale, it's not that big a deal, but on a large scale, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. So if you, for example, are working on uh, getting more hardy, Hardy variety out of Kansas, for example, you have to go up to Kansas to get. I drive all the way to Kansas. I've driven to Mississippi. I've driven to Kansas. I make probably four trips to Kansas a year for seed, for graft wood, and some, or just visit or go to a school or or go to a field day or go to a field days in Mississippi and, and Louisiana and and. Uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, and Oklahoma City, and, and uh, Ardmore, the field day this year is going to be in Ardmore, or not field day, the conference, the con conference is going to be in Ardmore, and uh, we'll have people from all over Oklahoma and North Texas come, there'll be 200 people that participate. Is the Noble yeah. Foundation hosting that then? Well, they're involved, I don't know if they're the host, mm -hmm. the Oklahoma con growers put the put it on and they 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 uh, they make sure that it's put on and with the help of OSU and and the Noble Foundation and, and uh, con growers there's a board of con growers that, mm -hmm. that make sure this all happens and, and with, that's what the con growers association board members do is is uh, make sure they have field days and, and uh, uh, classes lecturers from all over New Mexico and Georgia come lecture and all the people that's in the con professors in the pecan business in Oklahoma go 
all over to lecture about the cons. I mean, they trade out what they're, you know, they're doing different studies all the time. Nova Foundation has got a lot of stuff going on. We're, uh, there's all kinds of studies. They're, I'm involved in one that they're planting some trees to just study how big a hole to plant, put the tree in, whether it needs to be a 10 inch hole, a 12, 15, 24 inch hole, which is the best to uh, plant a tree. And they're gonna, it's gonna take probably five years to study that. So there's all kinds. The kind of business is not, it's not instant gratification. You've got to have a lot of patience. I was thinking about that when you were talking about, you know, 20, 25 years in. And I, that sounds like a long time, but when you think about the lifespan of what it takes to actually get to something that, you know, you can harvest Absolutely. and that you can, it's, it's not a very long time. No, it's not. I've, said, I've met more people that wish they'd planted pecans 10 years ago than people that's willing to plant them right now because they always think it's too late. But uh, I'm still planting trees, fixed to be 69. And, uh, you know, as long as I can plant one and it lives, that's, that's all my goal. I don't care if it has any nuts or not, but as long as it lives. So the ones that you and your dad harvested, uh, were those ones that he planted, were those... No, they were natives. natives. They'd be natives. Just, and and it was on this place, and, and we've lost, I bet uh, over the years, we, we probably lost half our trees, one thing or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, several times, winds, big winds with a big crop load and a lot of leaves, and the ground is really moist, and ground is soft and you get a you know a 70 mile an hour wind that's a big old tree and it just blows them right over it's just amazing how many blow over you know we and floods we i'm in an area i'm, a, I'm on a, the washita watershed of the lake texoma mm -hmm. and uh, in my lifetime this is flooded four four times back in 1957 it flooded and uh, we we had to uh, couldn't drive to town we had uh, it was over a road it, but each year each time it was it was 57 the next time was maybe 91 and uh, it uh, got a little deeper and then the last time a year and a half ago it, it got 18 inches in my house and I had to, had to ride a boat for 21 days to go to town. All my hired hands had to come to work in a boat while we worked on our pecan trees. And my pecan trees were a foot underwater at the peak. But we, we had things to do anyway, so we kept working. But we what had a big you, flood. What were you able to do with 18 inches of water or a foot of water? It, it, demolished my house and rebuild it. Did you? I had to completely strip it out. The walls, all the walls, flooring, doors, everything was gone. It, I mean, the cheap rock was stripped out. The, the insulation was stripped out. Just had the two, four studs all the way through the house and had to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we did, FEMA did help some. It was sure a benefit. It wasn't didn't save me, but it, it was a benefit. But anyway, it, it I had crop damage on my trees, I was gonna ask. but not a total loss. I would say probably five to percent loss of my trees, and you know it stunted them a little. Anything that was below the water yeah. for very long, I had trees that were completely underwater. And it, this was at a time when their leaves were on there, so any time the leaves were below water level. It, it killed those leaves, so anything above that was all right. Okay. So it stunted the trees a little bit. But Did it flood your greenhouses then? Yeah, there? flooded yeah, everything. It was an inch, and water was an inch deep in this room right here. Oh my gosh. This was the, one of the higher spots right here. I built up a, uh, a pad when I built this. I built up a pad probably 18 to 20 inches, but I wish I had gone to four more inches. Did you do that on purpose because yeah. of the flooding? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, 
the, since this is a watershed area, and you said that it seemed, it's gotten, you know, the flooding has been worse and worse over those periods, that period of time. I don't know if it'll be that bad, but I mean, it, it could be a nuisance again. But now, it was a freak deal. We had, we had a flood. Uh, lake got up and backed up, and then we had Hurricane Bill, and it dropped 11 inches of rain on the watershed. And the, the next day, it was it had a flash flood. And it was just up for for half a day, mm-hmm. and then it went back down. Yeah, but, but it was a pretty freaky deal. Not something that you think you need more flood control for. I like didn't. That. I'm not building back in that house. My son, I gave that to my son. <laughs> I'm I'm building a house on higher ground. <laughs> are you gonna stay on the sake on the farm? Huh? Are you gonna stay on the farm when you build, or are you? Oh, yeah, I've got it. Oh, yeah, it's down there at a higher spot. <laughs> well, um, okay. There's some, there's things I will want to come back okay. to, but I also want to talk back up quite a bit to. Um, how you moved into all this. So we, we kind of brushed over that, but I want to go back to, okay, your dad went to OSU. We know what he did. Um, you grew up in Tishomingo, and then how, there's some years missing there, which is really part of what I want to talk to you about, which is between graduating high school and deciding you want to be a cattle farmer, cattle rancher. So tell me about that. You did go to OSU at some point. You also went to Murray, I think. So maybe I went, walk to, uh, went, to, went to Murray. And uh, from Murray, I decided to go to OSU. My, my uh, like I say, my dad graduated. My sister attended OSU. My older sister attended OSU. And then she decided to get married. And so she didn't, she didn't continue, but she went to OSU. And, and my dad always had season tickets from when he graduated until when he couldn't go anymore in his 80s. And uh, I always had season. We always. And he graduated in '36, you said, right? Uh huh. Wow. Yeah, he had season tickets the whole time until, until he was probably in his late '80s. He had season tickets because he had a grandson playing with Barry Sanders. It was pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. Who was it? Who was he? His name was Greg Wolf. He was a member of the War Pigs. That's the offensive line. <laughs> And was so that would have been eighty eight, I think. Um, all right. So, you, your, what did your sister go there for then? While she was there, was it? What did she go for? Yeah. I don't know. You for, don't remember? I guess to find a man to get her MRS degree. <laughs> um, I'm just curious. It seems like most women who went that sort of general period were education or t- teachers or administrative. Yeah. So, just I don't curious. Know. I don't think she knew. <laughs> so you went to Murray, is that because yeah, it was... Yeah, I went to Murray and... Uh, because it was, you could stay home, is that yeah, what? Yeah, I went to Murray and stayed home. I knew knew, people, knew everybody. I didn't stay in the dorm, I stayed at the house. and, and But I knew it was a small school, knew everybody, and we had a lot of fun. And, and uh, I, I, I uh, had good grades. Then I decided to, I went to, to uh, OSU, enrolled up there, and... and First time away from home and and uh, had an apartment with a friend and uh, went one semester and didn't do very well. I it got kind of got lost. Mm-hmm. Several of my classes were way too big and and so. So did you go in as like a sophomore or a freshman? Do you remember? Was it your first or second year? Well, I might have been a maybe a sophomore. A sophomore. I didn't have a degree from Murray. I, I, I but I had had. Transferred some classes or hours yes, or whatever. Yeah, transferred some classes. That was probably a sophomore, sophomore. Um, so do you know why you went up there in the first place? Was there something you had in mind, or was it just something that was expected of you? Well, it it no, I enjoyed. I lo- I, I I I loved OSU as young when I was younger. So I went there because I liked it. I liked it. I wanted to go. You liked it from being up there when you visited for football games, or did you know it from other things? Uh, maybe not other things. No. No. Football games. Maybe. Did you go? Were you in 4-H, for example? Yeah, 
I was in 4-H. Did they have the big 4-H days at OSU when you were in 4-H? I think I went there to the Roundup. Or, the Roundup. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So did you have friends that went to OSU while you were still in Tishomingo, too? Oh, yeah. Did you go up and visit friends and things like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this was one of my questions. You and I talked a little bit about this. Sure. I'm interested to know what that more about what the fit wasn't so you talked about there being big classes right so you moved from from Tishomingo which is pretty small community up to OSU in Stillwater which is big compared to Tishomingo right like Mm. that's that's yeah that was a big change and it's a university town so there's a lot of young people I'm curious about also what was the what what was it that didn't fit what was it that you didn't have okay I'm I'm I, you know, I've got some ideas. I've thought about it. I've yeah. got ideas. I think one one thing was maybe my study habits weren't very good because I didn't have to study. <laughs> when you were in Murray? When I was in high school in Murray, I could, I could, I could, I was a math major. I, 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 I'm fairly smart, but I didn't have good study habits. So I, uh, in high school, my study habits weren't very good, but I could pass and make good grades. I don't know, my grades were A's and B's in high school, and yeah. probably A's and B's and C's in Murray. So part of that may have been that you um, were working harder, maybe more was expected of you, you had to work harder than you were used to in the classroom? Is yeah. Is that what you're... Yeah, that, and, and, and just, I probably just sat back instead of asking enough questions or, or getting some tutors or, or anything like that, I just I was kind of into myself. I just, I just sank, I guess, on my own. Well, so you also mentioned that the classes were too big. Were all your classes, like those big lecture hall classes? Um, a lot of them were, yeah. Um, a lot of them were. I mean, it was just lost. I, just, I don't know. I just... It's way past me. I don't know why I enrolled in those classes. <laughs> I don't know who enrolled me, but they sure messed up. <laughs> Did you have anybody in the university level that, um, like, a, a, what would they be called? I guess advisors or instructors or anything that you had any sort of interaction with or anybody that was helping you Not navigate? Really. No. No? Not really. I was curious. Um, so when you ended that semester while you were there, you just said you were done and decided to come home, or what happened? Yeah, I had, I had my highest grades were D's, <laughs> so I came home, and then I, uh, I can't remember what I did exactly, but I, after that, I don't know if immediately I went to Southeastern, mm-hmm. but I... Uh, enrolled in Southeastern and I went there two years, but I didn't graduate. Mm -hmm. And I had good grades, I could graduate. What was the difference between that, I wonder, between you going to OSU and you going to to Southeastern? Yeah, I don't know. It was just a lot different, a lot different. There wasn't very many. I mean, there was was teachers there, not monitors. But teachers I, at OSU or teachers at Durant? At Durant, they had mm-hmm. teachers. Down there. Oh, they had monitors at OSU. I understand because the class sizes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I don't know. The teacher might have been there. I've never been seen. But anyway, yeah. what did your parents um, think about you sort of going this round route for for your well college? I, I think it was they were. Uh, understanding about that. Mm-hmm. I suspect it wasn't that you weren't busy. You seem like you stay busy. Well, I wasn't as busy back then as I am now. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I might have changed when I got married. Yeah? Yeah, I got married when I was 26. So I was, I don't know if that's old or, or not, but it, it, I was a lot more mature. But when I was 25, I wasn't very mature and below that. But when I got married, it might have been my wife that uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm expected me to do some stuff. So, <laughs> so that's... Uh, 
So you went responsibility. To- <laughs> I didn't have any responsibilities when I was growing up. And when I got responsibilities, uh-huh. that's exactly what happened. I knew I had to do some stuff, so I did a lot. Yeah. So what did you do when you left Duranthan? You didn't graduate from there, but you spent two more years there. So it sounds like you were pretty close to pulling together an undergraduate degree. Yeah. But that... My wife had a degree. That's mm-hmm. the reason I married her. <laughs> but... It's good you married up. <laughs> yeah. No, she was, she was a farmer's daughter also. She was, she was raised on the dairy in, this, in Tishomingo. Oh, she's from Tishomingo too. Yeah, she went to Murray and then she graduated from Southeastern. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so did you all meet there then at Southeastern? No, we, we actually met here in Tishomingo. Neither one of us lived down there. Okay. We lived here and went to school there, community. Okay. To, to, it's not. It's thirty miles, mm-hmm. and but we met here, and uh, uh, anyway, when we got married and, and settled down. All right. So you you were living back in Tishomingo and going to school at Southeastern. Um, so were you still in a math major at that point, or were you doing something else? Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> I can tell how you invested you were in that part. Uh, yeah. Well, but okay, so that that is really, I guess, where I'm trying to get at you. I didn't really have a a, a goal of a of a field or what is it, a degree yeah, in, in, yeah, yeah. in in anything. Right. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So why were you going to school? Why were you going to get your undergraduate degree then? Why? Because mm-hmm. I you probably need one if you're going to go to work for somebody. <laughs> But I hired myself, and I didn't need uh-huh. a degree to do that. Uh-huh. So I wanted I wanted to work for myself. I I I, I like to work for myself. Yeah. I don't like to be ordered around too much. So, so at what point did you decide to go do that? Do what? Work for yourself. Oh. Well, I guess after I got married and I quit going to Southeastern, I decided that I'd. I better, so I, I went to the, the farmer's home and borrowed some money and bought some cattle, bought some land and ran cattle and uh, uh, we did some, I, I've always tried to be in, in, in the, on the leading end of, of technology on whatever I'm in and, and, and the cattle, I was doing some AI work. Mm-hmm. I learned how to embryo transfer, so I was doing embryo transfer, and uh, not real good at it, but I was good at it. But I learned how to do it, and learned, and I, I had a lot of cattle. Yeah, how AI'd, many head of cattle do you say you had? And you had all of them. I had three hundred cows. I had them all. I didn't have a didn't even have a cleanup bill. Just did it all, and uh, but that was, you know, that was. It's like early morning and late at night and everything else. It's pretty seven days a week. Uh, but I liked uh, doing doing that tech technical stuff that that kind of that's out of the ordinary. Something a little added value. And so I did that. We and I developed some pretty nice cattle and I had club calf sales and and, and back uh, before they hard before they had them. I had probably, there might have been one or two club calf sales before mine in Oklahoma, and I, I had five in a row, and then after that, it, it was everybody just wanting to do that. I was ahead of them for about five years, and then everybody started doing it, so it was a little tougher. So how so, did you come up with that then? If that was something that you were doing ahead of everybody else, how did you decide to do it? Well, let's look around. Looked around and saw the opportunity to do that and went to Texas and saw some club calf sales down there. So I said, man, I can do that. So I bred cows and ate them and, and raised calves and sold club calves and did pretty well. And we had uh, my oldest son, he was, uh, he showed a steer in Oklahoma City at the Fat Stop Show and uh, this time this time of year and he, he was in the Grand Champion Drive as, as a champion crossbred. 
And he, he, but he came in, he didn't get grand reserve, but he got third place on one that I raised. So that's, that was part of what we did. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. So you, you went and you looked around to see what other people were doing and you were into the technology side of it. Were there places that you would go to get to get resources or to be that you knew you'd be able to get ideas for what you wanted to do? Yeah, I studied, I, I studied embryo transfer in Tyler, Texas at a place that gave gave that course. Went down there and did that. And uh, in fact, I put on some AI schools at one time for American Breeders Service, ABS they call it. Used to be their representative. And, and uh, uh, did stuff like that. Yeah. So do you feel like you were getting what you needed to from services that were already provided other places? I think when we, when we talked at one point, you mentioned the extension offices sometimes as a place that you would talk to. Extension? Yeah. Yeah, I do a lot of communication with the extension and uh, different, uh, different offices in the state. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I talked to the Tulsa Extension Office quite a bit. I forget her name, but there's the director of that. Uh, uh, we talk about con tree sales. There are people that's interested. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and when we had that field day last fall, we uh, sent out a letter to all the extension. And I said, the OSU has got a pecan course that, that, that there's happen every year, uh, one day a month, and and uh, I support that and and uh, try to do things for them as far as uh, sometimes I have some, I supply door prizes for different places with trees, you know. Yeah. Noble Foundation also, I'll give them door prizes. And, uh, uh, but that con school at OSU is very important. I've been to it twice. Not recently, but I've been to that one twice. Back, different Dean McGraw. That's a long time ago. Dean McGraw. Uh, like as a student, you've been to it, or well, as, there? no, as a as a as a, a grower. As or, a grower. Yeah. yeah. Not 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 when I was younger, but uh, but I've been I've been to a lot of different schools like it. Texas A and M went to their con school, and, and uh, uh, but. You know, we're talking about OSU, and and, yeah. and I, there's a lot of things furnished through OSU that, that we're thankful for in the con business, plus other things too, but con research has been pretty good. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to pecans in a second, but I'm, I'm also curious about the business angle of what you do, because you're, to me, pretty obviously a, a good entrepreneur, like you... Have done several, uh, several I've different businesses. I got a lot of enterprises. Yeah. You got a lot of enterprises. Well, you, even just the larger ones, it looks like you know you have your pecan business that you still do that that is big, um, but you also do the pumpkin patch in the fall, which from what we talked about sounds pretty big. It's big. Um, and your your family just opened a mercantile in the last couple of years, which is sort of the store mm -hmm. that is downtown Tishomingo. Um, which seems like it's doing well too. I'm curious how you how you how you got to, to a good handle on the business side of things. Is it something that's intuitive to you? Is it something that you have resources? That... Now I don't know what 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 does intuitive mean. That you just kind of feel like you know what's going to work out. It oh. feels like it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that I can see a need for things. Yeah. Now, they may not all be successful, but I'm, I, I've, I've had a lot of enterprises. But now, I've also got a, I have a, uh, the only uh, uh, shaved ice business in town. <laughs> shaved ice is a big industry in Oklahoma. I know. I can't believe you're the only one in town, really. I, I keep the others from up. <laughs> But anyway, we make we got our own ice. We get ice maker. We've been in probably ten years in that business or longer. So how do you look around, for example, and say, "Well, let's do a shaved need, ice business"? Yeah. Well, they need one. They need a good one. They need a good one. They, just, they might have had one, but they need a good one. We've been in the same location. We where were we? Talking about 
you how you sort of developed your business sense like like you you talked earlier about um you know you got into ranching and you also said you went broke doing that twice right so but you're obviously successful there's, in business there's, there's, so there's, 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 well, my, you, you want my philosophy? I do want your philosophy, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll give it to you. Let's get back <laughs> on there. Are you got I'm, I'm going, yeah, we're You're good. going? We're okay. Good. Well, this is my philosophy. There's never a, there's never a, 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 a black day or a, or a market collapse that's, that you can't use for, for your advantage. That's where money's made. I've learned that in the pecan business mainly. See, uh, I have a lot of volume, pecans. I harvest a lot of pecans each year. Well, there's some years there's not much demand for those pecans. This year, uh, I averaged two dollars a pound on natives, which is that's uh, that's unheard of. That's historic. That's that's uh, that's a good thirty, forty, maybe almost fifty percent, fifty cents higher than. I've ever got before. So that's historic high. Well, if you sell all those pecans because you don't want to keep those, those are too high. All right, in the past, I'm, I'm, uh, in my volume, large volume days since uh, 2000, about 2005, I'd have a, a we would clean 500,000, a million, some one year clean two million pounds of pecans here. Well, the years that I clean two million pounds of pecans, sometimes there's too many, and the price gets cheaper than production costs. Okay, 19, I don't know, 2008, might have been 2007. I think it was, it was the spring of 2008. I stored nine semi loads that they they weighed. 50,000 pounds, so that's half a million pounds. I stored, I couldn't sell them, they, or, or they were too cheap, they were 45 cents. So I stored seven semi loads, couldn't get them sold. I had to go to the bank, and borrow the money. I had partners, I didn't do but two loads. I had uh, some partners that had loads, and we stored them in Kansas City in the, in the, in the Cold storage up there at National Cold Storage, which is I, I'm, it's an old mine of some kind, and uh, we kept those. The next year, couldn't sell them. Twelve months later, couldn't sell them. Well, the next eighteen months after I stored them, I sold them for a profit. Profited about twenty five cents over my cost. Mm -hmm. Cost money to store them. Every month I had to make a payment to the bank, but made money on those. And, and of course, 2008 was what? The oh. Great Depression. Uh, yes. <laughs> or, a, or a Great Depression. The, the Might great, have been the Great Depression. The but Great it, Recession. I great mean, great Recession. It, it was just a recession. But anyway, I got caught up in that, but that was a struggle. I mean, I was broke that those years right there. I mean, I was everything was tight. But come out on that all right. Well, about, about uh, four years ago, they were cheap, and I stored, I mean, I store, I can't remember now if it's five or six loads, six loads, same thing. Couldn't get any, couldn't get 45 cents for them, so I stored them, and the next year, they were as cheap the next year, and I had four or five loads. And but I, I just couldn't justify storing them. I already had some in storage, so I didn't store those. I just sold them. Hoping I'd get a little bonus. So I sold them for forty five cents. But the bonus never came. They I don't know if I got cheated or, or just wasn't anything left. Mm -hmm. But the price had gone up since then. And the ones I had in storage the year after I sold those two cheap, 18 months after I stored those, I made a profit, sold them for a dollar. And the ones I let go about less than a year before that, 
got 45 cents for them. Then not those I had in stores, I got a dollar. Well, there's you you you've got to know what you're doing. Well, pecans will store for five years or better yeah. in that storage facility. It's for zero degrees. They'll store for more than five years. So next year, they're 45 cents. I'm gonna put them in cold storage and I won't have a worry in the world because in five years, they're gonna go up. They're gonna be a shortage. There's always this. There's always too big a crop. But the, all commodities are that way and you can, but now corn, uh, pecans aren't a commodity crop so you can't, they don't have a government program for them so you just own your own. Right. So, but anyway. So who's your, who's your market here then? Who do you sell them to? Who do I sell them to? It's to shellers. The, 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 they're, 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 uh, they're seven basic shellers, big shellers. And used to be, and there may be less now. Oh, they go broke all the time and then they sell and somebody else buys it. And, and, and but anyway, there's there's just some bit lo seven large set shellers, and then there's some micro shellers that that maybe can use a million pounds a year. But most see, there's 300, 350 million pecans processed a year, so those shellers do 100 million or not maybe not 50 million or 25 million, but small sheller a million that's not very much. But, but anyway, but there's opportunity there. There's a lot more opportunities in the con business because of that market swing. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could have bought, had those 45 centers and could have sold them for $2? Well, there's people that do that. I don't know if you can get $2 for them, but you could have got a dollar 50 or 60 on them because they, they were, you couldn't tell the difference between them and fresh, but that that's, that's an opportunity. That's, that's, but I, I, it took me a while to learn all that. How did you learn it? That's that's a question. How did I learn it? Yeah. Just took the chance. I, I, one thing I won't do is go to the casino because there's no there's no chance there. It's you gonna lose your money, <laughs> and if you win money, that's worse. That's the worst thing that could happen. Win money, but. Uh, you know, I, 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 I take risk every once in a while. But I, with experience, you can modify the risk by the, maybe by the way the history mm -hmm. is of, that, of the business, because it's so up and down uh, price-wise and, and production-wise. It's not nothing stable on production. The amount of pounds is always unstable. It can be big or small, and there's always a shortage or oh, too many. So at what point did you decide to move from harvesting and cleaning to um, growing? Growing? Well, that was another, another, in, for me to be successful, I need employees. And for me to have enough employees, I need to work them year round. So that that means I need I need to work them during pecan season, harvesting in November, December, January, maybe February, and then growing nursery trees is from February, March, April, May, June, July, August, and so you gotta you gotta have year-round work. So you gotta have something for them to do. That's the reason I plant vegetables for my labor. Have something for them to do. So the vegetable crops that you do is so you can keep, just, it, keep it going year round or keep it's, The vegetables, I don't care if I make any money or not. I just want, to, if I can break even and keep them working, pay them, not I have to bring it out of my pocket. I just break even on vegetables, I'll be happy. So what's the, what is your goal to not just have seasonal labor to keep year round labor? Why, why do that? Why? Mm -hmm. Because of, of uh, undependable labor, if you if you're having to rehire, you you want to keep the people you can count on. Okay, the people I've got working for me. Did you notice anything about those people? They're Latino. Yeah, they are <laughs> Latino. Well, they're they're uh, they're on a H two A government work program. They've got visas, and they can only work ten months out of the year. And they've got to be back in Mexico and. For two months so they've got a, a routine and I've got them going back on my off season 
which is is uh, it's actually uh, October, which is my pumpkin patch. But that's all I do is pumpkin patch. I don't do much else. But after the pumpkin patch, I get busy again, so they go home. But you know, those I'm training those guys. This is the second year for them to come. They went home and came back, and uh, we get along real well, and they appreciate what I do for them, and, and, and they're good workers and, and don't have any trouble out of them. So how did you get matched with them? Is there a program for that, or, or how did you hire them? There, there was a guy in the pecan business that had, had them before I did, and, and he told me about them, so I went through the channels to get that done, and there's facilitators that, that uh, do that for you, and it's too complicated for one person to do it. So. I have a facilitator in, in uh, Fairview, Oklahoma, that goes through all the stuff and, and to get there. But now the the workers, there's two ways of getting those. You can get some names from somebody that knows the names or where they're located, or you can get a recruiter, and and the recruiter will find them. They'll put an ad or something, and so you don't know what you're getting. But every one of these guys I got working for me, I, in fact, four, four of them are brothers. They're all four brothers, and, and they live in the same place. And I knew when they came who they were, and, and they're, boy, they're good. And yeah. they're, they're really good. Uh, so really what, pleased with them. Why did you decide to go through that program instead of hiring just folks around here? Well, I've, I've, hired, I've worked people around here, and, and the problem with people around here and, and is they don't have to work and my my most important work is june july and august out there grafting trees and it's pretty difficult in june july and august i don't have to tell you it's hot it's hot it's hot some years it's terrible hot and some years it's even worse but it but now we we got i've got i've just i've bought these garden carts and they work on the garden carts and they I'm, put an umbrella on there and mm -hmm. and these trees are growing and they they they're always on the shady side of the tree working they switch in the afternoon to the other side of the trees to to work so they're always in the shade but they can stand the heat and anybody can stand the heat for a little while and, and it's not hard work it's just monotonous constant work so yeah. I mean, I can hardly stay in the business without them, so I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to to this H-2A worker program, but that's H-2A is agriculture related, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how many there is in the United States. I never, I don't know that number, but there, I'm sure there's a significant amount. Yeah. Are you talking about with the current political field with yeah. the recent election? Yeah. Possible that there could be some issues come up, I don't know. I don't know why there would be, but there could be. Mm -hmm. Agriculture depends on a lot of migrant labor. Yeah. That's in California and Texas probably. But a lot of, there's a lot of migrants in Oklahoma. Yep. So this is your second year with this group of group of workers and uh -huh. it's working out for you. Really good. I mean, they're uh, one of them could speak just a little English, and the others couldn't speak any. And 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 I, but I've had Mexican workers for a long time ago. I had a guy that worked for me for a long time when I was in the cattle business, and and uh, so I can communicate with them a little bit. And I can't speak Spanish, but I I can communicate with them. But they're learning English. They're uh, eventually going to get the driver's license. They don't have driver's license. They can't. Oklahoma, you, you you can't take a driver's test in Spanish. You gotta be, you gotta have English. So they're gonna have to study English to get our driver's license. But we're gonna do that eventually. Is that something that you help facilitate then? Do, do you help them figure out how to do that? Do what now? English? Yeah, I get what they need for English. Yeah, well, yeah, I take them wherever they need to go. I would go to Walmart every Sunday, mm -hmm. and uh, they shop and and they. They can cash their check locally, so they I take them cash their check at the local grocery store, and then on payday, and then 
on Sunday we go to Walmart and they'll wire their some of their money home to their families and they've all got families and and uh, uh, and they do a little shopping at Walmart. Sometimes we'll stop and have a Mexican dinner on Sunday and and. Uh, Where do you eat Mexican food in town? Oh, there's a real good one here in town that we eat sometimes. But we we go to Walmart. That's in my deal. So we eat over there and uh, but on Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. We, we we have a real nice Mexican restaurant. They have a band, mariachi band. And last year at Cinco de Mayo, we all went up there at about four o'clock and had, had a beer and ate Mexican food and listened to the music. They really enjoyed it. That's cool. Requesting some songs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, we had a good time. Huh. That's interesting. Well, what do you think some of the biggest changes are in the pecan industry since you've been in it then? Some of the biggest changes. Yeah, like what are some of those pivotal points when you look back? Well, I think there's more knowledge, uh, a lot more knowledge on my part, but I think substantially on everybody else's part on the product and what it is and what it takes to to market that product. And, and say so I, I market mine direct in the Houston when I started out. I, I just sold them to, I, I drove somewhere in Ada and sold them. And, and now I ship them semi-load to the, direct to the sheller. Mm -hmm. uh, but other people in the pecan business are more aware of pricing and the market. And, and the market fluctuation is, is kind of like uh, oil. It, it, it's up and down daily. And, and people aren't aware of where the price is at. But I'm more aware of it. I've got people I call and check prices daily or weekly and and so I know where we're going and and uh, the marketing is the most important thing of con businesses you can grab you can harvest them get them all gathered up but you've got to be able to have a timely marketing because the price is so volatile you know once I get a bunch gathered up and and see some more coming in I like to contract my prices Kind of, it's like wheat prices and corn prices. You can contract them. Well, cons are too. If you got the product, you can sell ten loads. You may not have but six loads clean, but you know you're going to have ten. So you contract ten loads, so you're guaranteed that price. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's important. If you just wait around, the price usually falls off at the end. People, you know the. the there's such there's just seven buyers or, or so and, and 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 if one of them pulls out that weakens the market and so when one gets all the cons they need they stop buying it weakens the market when three or four pull out it gets a lot weaker and then pretty soon it's a one person game and they can just give what they want so it, it can drop pretty fast but that's pretty important the, the marketing timely marketing of the cons yeah yeah, that's changed, and and the knowledge of what's happening. And when I first started, we we harvested and put them in tow sacks, 150 pound tow sacks. Well, you can takes takes. Uh, I may be wrong about this, but I'm gonna say it takes 300 or 400 tow sacks to fill a semi, and you gotta tote those things in there, on you, pick them up, carry them. 150 pounds. Well, that I wouldn't still be in the con business, but we went to super sacks, which weigh 2,000 pounds, and you you have a forklift and you load the truck with the forklift. So you don't. There's no manual labor, but there used to be. 15 years ago, there used to be manual labor for picking them up, carrying them. It's terrible. So how did that development come about? Like, how did you make that shift, and when did you know to do Well, I saw that happening, and 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 uh, I could see that. So, tow sacks weren't the way to go, so I went to boxes, bought some boxes, and so we, so we could use the forklift. All right. Um, okay, now I gotta think back. We just uh, talking about, I think the marketing part of it. So and how you learned that. So that was the big. That was one of the big curves that you said has changed since you've gotten into this business. Yeah, the, the marketing and the knowledge of the market is, is a lot improved. I mean, it was a secret. I mean, people out in the country, people would come to their place and buy their pecans, 
and there was no networking with other producers, so you didn't really know what the prices were unless you just kind of heard at the coffee shop or something. So you didn't really know what they were worth. But now it's the internet and, 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 and people, you know, people telling me and then I telling people that the, what the market is and what it's going to. And so there's more knowledge of what the market is. So, But there's still, it's some people that don't know what the market is that sell at pecans and they don't have no, they don't have any idea what they're worth. They have some idea, but not exactly. Do they sell them to sellers or do they sell them to local people then? Well, usually those people don't sell to sellers. Sellers don't mess with, now you gotta have a semi-load to talk to a sheller. They, they don't mess with, right. I mean, shellers are impressive. I've been to nearly all the shelling plants and, and watched them work which is, you have to be invited to do that. You can't just walk in and look at it. <clears throat> but it is such a process, cracking these pecans and shelling them out, is it's just unbelievable how much equipment's down through there and the way that's flowing. And they're, they're shelling, uh, yeah, I don't know how much they shell a day, but I'm, I'm gonna say they could shell a semi-load or more a day. It's so, I mean, it's it makes you, wonder how small you are compared to what they're doing, how little importance you are yourself because they're so, you're not, we're one load or two loads is not very important to them. They got hundreds and thousands of loads. Takes, takes 20 semi loads to be a million pounds, see? So they've got, say they've got, they've got uh, 50 million pounds there. That's thousand loads. What would they care about your one load, give or take, whether they bought it or not? It doesn't really make a, not very much percentage of their business. Because they're interested in good cause. They're interested in relationships. And, yeah. and I've got relationships to more and more of the shellers. You develop that. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, I can talk to several shellers and, and, and other people in the pecan business. Is that sort of information something that, for example, the OSU pecan courses or, or work days or field days, are those things that they address? Okay, now that, that I don't know how much marketing is involved in that. That's kind of, I don't know if that's business, business eth ethics or, you know, but they, they, they want you to know, uh, uh, Universities want you to know how to grade pecans. That's important, mm -hmm. and that's how they sell them. And I hadn't mentioned that to you. You may not know, but they, they you sell a semi load on the yield of that semi load, and a and a pecan native pecan will yield forty to to forty two percent edible meat. Forty two forty two percent, and it could be slightly more than that, but it could be all the way down to. 30% if they're not very good. Mm -hmm. So you you grade them and I have a I have a grading I have a scales and I, I I'll weigh out a pound on the gram scales and and I'll shell I'll shell a pound of pecans. It takes two hours for me to shell a pound of pecans and pick all the meat out and then I weigh the meat, weigh the shell, weigh the damage and uh, uh, but I get the yield. And the yield is the edible meat, and and generally speaking, it's between 40 and 42 percent. And you sell it on that. And there's a difference of uh, this year, the difference between 40 percent, which would be say two dollars, 42 percent would be two dollars and ten cents. It'd be ten cents difference a pound on the yield on two percent, and they could vary more than that. But two percent generally, well, on a semi-load, ten percent is five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. The difference. Yeah. So it's important to know what they yield, you know what you need to be getting for those. They, and that's how they bid them. They'll bid you two dollars or two ten, and and they they know what to grade. They grade them and they give you a bid, and you can accept it or try somebody else.
or put it in a cave. Yeah, put it in a cave. But not at $2. <laughs> no. No. So do, are, do any of your kids, are they in this business with you? My son, my youngest son, the artist is in the business. He's, uh, uh, right now he's on vacation, but he, uh, he went to Missouri and planted trees in Missouri, uh, up in Nevada, Missouri. And, uh, but he's, he grafts and he, he manages the grafting and he cuts most of the graft wood. So, I mean, he's taken over. He, he knows how to do it all. He, he, he's, uh, he, uh, he's gonna, I think, be all right in the con business. He's got other, he's a landscaper. He, 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 but he's in partners with the snow cones and the mercantile, but he's uh, in the pecans, but he's also, he does, uh, I say he's a landscaper, he does uh, uh, lawn mowing mm -hmm. contracts in southern Oklahoma. He mows, you know, I don't know, 50 or 60 yards that he contracts for different, from different people, from the, the tribes, some tribal grounds and some some uh, he does uh, some mowing for some uh, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac repos. He does those in Southern Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Travels to Lawton quite a bit, spend a day in Lawton yeah. mowing yards. But he just that's, he gets that on the internet and gets gets that all lined up. Yeah, just something to do. Not that you're not busy enough. <laughs> what about the landscaping side of what you do with the nursery? Is who do you sell your trees to? Okay, the trees, I usually sell those, most of the bulk of those, that guy that was just in here, he's yeah. in con production. Oh. And he's, he's, uh, he's planting those to, to, in an orchard. He, he bought a hundred trees, and so he's gonna plant those, and they'll be in production seven or eight years. And, uh, but that's who I sell my trees to, people that wanna have orchards. Now, there was another couple that, that bought 18 trees, mm -hmm. and they're just, kind of a little backyard orchard. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll have some pine trees someday. You know, I've got them plant, planted in my yard that are eight or 10 years old that are in production. So, I mean, that's, I can see how long it takes for them to produce if you take care of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that when they start production, it, the trees I sell, the best trees I sell will be in production seven or eight years. And, and each year they're nearly double production and you, I'm planting 35 trees per acre, <clears throat> generally on my place, 30, you know, there's different spacings. You, you can plant 35 trees per acre or you can plant 25 trees per acre and that's just the difference in the spacing. But they'll, when they get in, 35 to 35, when they get in production, they might produce 2,000 to 2,500 pounds an acre and those pecans could be worth two dollars to three dollars a pound. The improved are, are worth more, so the, the natives are worth two this year, but the improves could be worth two and a half, three dollars. If they make two thousand pounds an acre and they're and they're worth two dollars, that's four thousand dollars an acre. That's quite a bit of yeah. income per acre. Yeah. So you think you'll keep that up? The the um Nursery? Or? Yes, the nursery. The nursery, I've just started this nursery about, I've sold three crops, and so that was six years ago. I started it six years ago. I was growing trees at a, on a small scale before that for 20 years, but I finally figured out how to do it with in vegetable production because I bought this machine that puts that plastic mulch down. So. My, in the past, my palm trees had too much competition with, with grass. Mm -hmm. So this plastic mulch worked, planted my trees. Takes three years from be, to be sellable. So the first year that I planted trees, I didn't make any money. In the second year, I planted trees, I didn't make any money. In the third year, I planted trees, and, and but I did sell some, but my first crop was short. But now, I'm in to moderate production not maximum, but pretty close to maximum. But every three years, so I'm planting in my greenhouse those trees you saw that were just up about six inches. Those those won't be sellable for over three years. So, mm -hmm. so it's a that's a long term deal. They got to be patient on that deal. Yeah. So when do you stop? 
I don't know. If you don't ever stop planting, you never can stop. You just keep it going. But it's worth your time is what it sounds like. Yeah. And I don't know that it'll be worth the time forever. It might, everything else I've got into, there comes competition sometimes. And that's good. I need some competition in the snow comes down. <laughs> What about the pumpkin pads? Yeah, I need some there too. I've got competition in that, but they're they're not as good as I. I'm the best in Oklahoma. That we talked about that. Tell me about that. Well, now, agritourism. Now, is that out of? Is that a extension? It's probably the state. Could be state state ag department. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a representative that comes out, and we're and uh, they have a group that has tours and 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 and. Uh, I think the, the lady that, the young gal that was here, Becca, I forget her last name, but she's moved on to a bigger, better job. But anyway, the, the ag, uh, agritourism is big in Oklahoma, and, and we're into it. We, we uh, that pumpkin patch, we've developed a, a tour that we tour our trees, and, and I sell trees because of that. And I give a little hay ride. We got a hay rides, and we hay ride through the, the nursery and, the, and of course the other part too the, the by the by the corn maze and the pumpkin patch and I get to see all that and then I, I, I we get to the pecan trees and I talk about George Washington and he planted pecan trees and he and his favorite snack was pecans he carried pecans in his pocket is that true absolutely how do you know that and Thomas Jefferson also really planted pecan trees Absolutely. How did you find that out? It's on the internet. <laughs> you just look it up. I look it up. Look it up. Anyway, George. I never thought to look that up. I don't know. I, my spiel on the on the deal is all all these little kids in the trailer. I said, now George, he he ate pecans because they were healthy and good. And I said, now it's it's he ate those just like you eat Skittles. <laughs> uh, but anyway. It, but I tell them about that and, and the production numbers of uh, how many millions of pounds and how many 200 million pounds we're exporting to China. I'll give them all that. Plus how long it takes for a pecan tree to come in production, how long it took to grow those trees. And I showed them the graphs and, and uh, all the parents are just, they just can't believe all that. Just like you can't believe all there is in the pecan business. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. So how long have you been doing the pumpkin patch then? Eight years. What got you started in that part of My wife, she wanted to have that. And uh, I don't know why she did. Oh, we had a daughter that lived in Texas and had some grandkids and they had a, what do they call it, the big orange pumpkin patch down by, uh, uh, not Louisville, but close to Louisville, Frisco, north of Frisco. Mm-hmm. And we went to that. And so we built one I like better. <laughs> but anyway, we built one and and and, uh, and organized it. We had facilities. We had a, we didn't build any facilities. Now we uh, the agritourism department or ag, uh, department of agriculture has a has a uh, fund grant for agritourism and we got a matching grant for our bathroom suite when we first started that out we just had one little room bathroom for all these people well then we the next year we got a, a grant matching grant to build a handicapped bathrooms with uh, several toilets for men, uh, girls and boys and uh, we did that and then we bought <coughs> cafeteria tables from, from schools that had had some for sale, and so we have places for them to sit and, and uh, uh, all that. We furnish stuff for the, the parents if they want a hot dog or uh, at the pumpkin patch. Mm-hmm. And we made the hay rides and all that had to be a certain regulation to, to be safe. You had to have rails to keep them in there. And, you know, and there's still people that don't have that, that have hay rides, but it's very dangerous. You know, it. Uh, but we haven't had any injury. We try to be real safe. safe. We got supervisors and, and uh, uh, people that work that keeps an eye on all the all the different events. We probably got a half a dozen events, duck races that we use a pitcher pump and uh, 
down a half a PVC pipe and pump the water and the, flo the duck float, plastic duck floats down. There's four of them. And they have a big race. Oh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Kids have a lot of fun. And uh, other things that we do as far as group goes, that uh, uh, the hay rides. And we have, have a neighbor that raises uh, 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 water dogs, uh, Labrador retrievers. And he gives demonstrations with young dogs and mature dogs, and they go down there to the pond, and he'll throw a, a lure out there, and that that dog will sit there until he tells him to fetch, and then he'll go get that thing, and those kids just love that dog in that water. It's just really exciting for them. But we, we have different things for them to see, and, uh, and they pick their own pumpkins when we have them, which is, the last two years we've had good pumpkins. So they, they picked their own pumpkins. Yeah. Corn maize is pretty neat. You got a lot going on. Um, I think that was all the questions for me. Is there anything, oh my gosh, linking back. Is there anything I didn't ask about with either home or industry or well, Tishomingo in general? I don't know. There's a lot going on in Tishomingo, but as far as the farm here goes, it, it's it it uh, you know it's it's a struggle to to maintain land farmland. I mean, local people to have farmland because there's people moving in from Dallas area that's buying up land that can pay more than what I can make on it, and people from California that sell. In Los Angeles, and, you know, have a lot of money to spend, so they they're buying up a lot of farmland, and I don't know what they're doing. I was going to ask to do what with? I don't know. Just to spend their money. They want to move to Oklahoma. So Some that's the raising the price of real estate for farmland is. Yeah, it? yeah. Well, yeah, it is, and I don't know exactly if it's high or not, but it seems high. I mean, it's it's all always going up, but I have a. I fear that land will, we're trying to buy land if we could, I mean, but it's, it's getting so high, you, you, you can just buy so much of it and, and this keeps going up, but you know, uh, it's hard to justify agricultural land because people from the cities are, are that they don't need to make a living in farming. They buy that land and you can't compete with them if they don't need to make a living. If I've got to make a living to pay for it, I can't pay as much as if they've already got the money, but you know, that's the American way though, which is all right. Do you think in this area that has anything to do with the, like the Blake Shelton connection and the... It, now, that is, that is something, but not in the farming industry, but in downtown, in downtown, those businesses, uh, before, before uh, uh, Miranda Lambert put in, put in the pink pistol, you couldn't, you, they couldn't sell that property downtown. Couldn't give it away. And there was a furniture sale, uh, sales lady that had all those stores rented with furniture in there that she sold. And she was done, had a good business, but it was cheap rent. But when Miranda put that pink pistol in, that raised, shot the prices up and there was a bunch of, stores went in and, and were very successful for about 18 months and then it it kind of moderated and, and she quit coming and and so it's depressed but now the chickasaws have been in the works on doing some big things and still doing some big things and they're they're uh, they're i don't know that they've increased land prices but they have a little or the town, but they they bought property, and so some older houses have got a value a little bit more than what they're worth. But but they're buying some of that, putting land together for their their powwow area. Uh, they got several blocks bought up in one location, so they're they're doing that. But they're not in competition downtown Main Street. But they're going to improve the business by building a motel, we need a motel desperately. We don't have one that's suitable for for uh, most guests, but uh, they're gonna build a motel and a casino, which is gonna help 
like that. But Blake Shelton, when he uh, announced that in December that he was going to put in this venue, he called it, uh, it, it increased business prices. It increased the real estate prices on Main Street. Got more interest. And that's the one in the old lady Smith bread and breakfast. Is that well? Right? That's not going to be it. The oh. one where the pink pistol he bought. I see. He bought out Miranda, and he's got another deal there. And 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 it's you need to look at that online. But it he announced that at Nashville, and he's in partners with a group that owns the Grand Ole Opry, and I forget the name of the enterprise they are, but it's an investment. Mm -hmm. and they build hotels and stuff, venues and stuff, got a lot of money. But anyway, they're going to do that and do one in Tishomingo, and he thinks that the one in Tishomingo is going to be pretty pretty good, pretty popular. We'll see, see if it uh, increases our, uh, our tourism. It, when we had tourism when Pink Pistol was here. Our store was really doing well. And time. when that left, it's, it's not doing as well. It's still doing all right. But we've got a pretty good business uh, uh, plan with, uh, we have some uh, uh, consign consigners, some booth rent that rentals that, that pay, that pays the rent. So so we're in pretty good shape. Well, if we're not, we don't make much money, we still get rent paid by the booth rental. But, and that changed, when he announced, Blake announced in our booths, we sold out of booths and we got a waiting list of people to, to sell stuff because we know it's going to happen. Everybody knows it's going to happen. Yeah. We're planning on it. So, uh, but that's not part of my deal. Now, that, the, my Baker Mercantile is my wife's. <laughs> that's hers, and I've got, and the rest of the stuff is mine. Hers, things that I do. But the pink, the, 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 uh, Pumpkin patch is hers. She, she thought of that. Sounds like it's uh, all hands on deck. Yeah, it is. Patch, it sure. is. We work together yeah. and yeah, we have a lot of help. We have to, we hire quite a few employees for, for a town this side. We have several employees. For the month of October leading up to October? October, November, December. I, I, I may have 20 employees in, in December. November, December, and January, 20 employees. What are they doing? Well, they're in the con deal. Oh, in the con uh, deal. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, it uh, takes a lot of workers to do that. And uh, so I hire extra people, mm -hmm. local people, and they, they just, they, you know, they work for Christmas money, mm -hmm. and then they kind of quit. That works pretty good. Yeah. All right. Well, I've enjoyed it. Is I've that... learned a lot, yeah.